let's start. Uh, my name's Thomas. I'll be teaching the kayak level one and two. Uh, we'll go through some intro to kayak first, but probably won't take very long because I would assume if you're interested in kayak, you would have do some pretty straightforward research. Most of what we have here, you can find on the website as well. So uh, they're pretty straightforward. Um, uh, in terms of what's being tested, uh, it's slightly easier than CFA or FRM and it's more focused in terms of what it's trying to do. So I'll go through the content first, and then I'll do uh, a few questions as a demo of what will happen in class. And then uh, my colleague Mavis will come in. She'll go through the pricing and other things so you know better what is available, okay? So um, first, I guess, um, uh, my name's Thomas. I'm from uh, Hong Kong, but I would assume uh, if you're here, you would have several things in your mind. One would be either I have other alternatives. So here you might have uh, CFA, which is happening right next door, uh, and it's a, a, a level two seminar as well, or FRM. Um, many people here take FRM class as well, so pretty much your three alternatives. So uh, it's hard to choose. So for me, <laughs> I'll just a straightforward, just do them all. I had some free time at that time, so it was a little bit easier. But it's complementary, actually. It's hard to do one without knowing the other. I guess you can think of CFA as an intro to finance. So it's good to get your foot in the door. If you're not um, a finance major, then it gives you all the basics. And it's pretty hard on accounting as well, if you do level one uh, CFA. For FRM, it's more quant-based and many jobs are being in the back office where you're looking for uh, risk management uh, alternatives or choices to do. And it's pretty, um, uh, you see the different uh, uh, enrollment depending on the market. So around this time, you would have more on the FRM side because now there are many news, a lot more news of market not doing so well. Uh, Kayak is on alternatives investment. So uh, like CFA, you would have less enrollment around this time because of the market. Because if you read the news, Asian has the lowest uh, hedge fund startup recently because of the market. So, uh, but at the end, it's complementary. If you look at it, one way would be CFA is like a general surgeon being a doctor. So you learn everything about being a doctor, but everything uh, in a pretty straightforward, uh, minimal level. Kayak is like your brain surgeon. You're focusing on one specific area. Uh, and so um, it, for the kayak, it assumes you know some basic finance. So if you have done other majors that are non-finance, it might be uh, Level one be some a little bit more difficult because it assumes you have the basic knowledge like cap M and efficient market and the basic things. So here, um, quick thing about me: I was in accounting first. Um, it was for me <laughs> not very exciting, but it's very useful. It's amazingly how much easier it is for fi finance if you know accounting. So I was doing that for a little while, and then I went to an iBank uh, for about a decade, and I retired early. <laughs> and after that, I do my own investment, and I teach uh, free time uh, in different places. So back to the AI area, um, if I look at accounting, CFA, uh, normal corporate finance, I was doing both uh, tr sales and trading and corporate finance. I was doing it both sides in different countries. So AI, it's exciting, actually. It's fun to actually do, uh, and you can see results very quickly. Uh, when I was being an associate in an iBank, I was doing pitch books for you know six months and then doing deals, but deals don't come very often. And then you do a lot of analysis, which is useful. But for AI, uh, it's easy to see results of what you are doing. And um, if you're good or not, it can show very quickly. Because if you're in an iBank doing corporate finance, sales, and trading, you can be average and be there forever. It's possible. But for AI, it's very fast to determine how good you are. And normally, it's like a Darwin world, where if you're not very good, you get rolled over pretty quickly. But on the, other s on the other hand, when you look at what's being sold now, 
Um, when I first worked for an iBank, I was doing structured products. So I was doing uh, something like the uh, equity linked notes. So people come and buy a fixed income investment. If the share price or something go down, they pick that up in, in, in instead of cash. And that time was a big deal. So uh, people had to sign a lot of things. They were asking how to do it. There were no live feed at that time. So it's pretty preliminary, uh, pretty uh, uh, primitive. But nowadays, you can even go to a regular, uh, uh, regular bank account and log in and do some of these AI products, which were advanced things uh, a few years back. But now you can do it pretty easily. If you go online and search for, hello, if you go online and search, search for FX trading, you see many firms in UK in particular where you can just open an account very easily. They even have demo accounts. You can open it, play with it for a month. With they give you free money, and you play with it, and they have very advanced things you can do just opening an account. So you can do binary options, uh, uh, many, many different options you can do disguised in a trading format. So you can see many AI products being filtered down into er every area of life. And so in a way, while we study the, the uh, overall structure, how they do it, but for work-wise, you see a lot of these investment products everywhere. So um, one of my other role is a trainer for some private banks. And a lot of times, it helps them market. Because if you are selling to a high net worth in a, cli a cl client, they ask, so what does this do? You're actually selling lots of structured products to fit what they want. And so if you see the, uh, the, the, uh, uh, the advertising, I think, for UBS, where a guy come, he hesitated, didn't know what to say. And then he said, I want to retire by the seaside on the beach in the house. So you're fitting everything structured to his needs based on his cash flow and his wealth and his income. So all these are actually built inside many normal products now, which we're doing. Except we're doing it in a trading perspective, but it permeates everywhere in the finance world now. So in terms of alternatives for, for jobs, it's actually a lot more uh, frequently find people needing expertise knowing structured products or AI than your regular stocks and bonds. So here, um, uh, many companies use it now. Uh, insurance company is a pretty big player in the market. Uh, previously, pension funds cannot do a lot of these AI products, but now they allocated uh, some portion of their wealth or money to AI. So job-wise, it's pretty uh, getting bigger and bigger overall. So for kayak program, uh, in a way, uh, it's one way to get in, in the door. Because if you walk in, uh, in a way, with, without any uh, uh, demonstration of skill or background or history, in a way you're saying, I come here, you pay me lots of money, and, I'm train and you train me. If I make money, I take my bonus. If I lose money, then I leave. So it's hard to get in because everyone is trying to trade and make money. So it's hard for them to spend time training you uh, for no particular good reason, other than if you are a very good potential, good trader, or a good structurer. So getting the program of kayak destination will show you have initiative and in wanting to do this, and you have the basic knowledge. So when you join, you're not starting from scratch. You have basic knowledge. You can go whenever uh, they can teach you. Uh, if you're in the business already, it's one place where I guess for promotions it'll be uh, uh, easier. And we have for students many uh, not actual traders, but admin or back office or risk management. Where because there's many alternatives of, of how they trade, they want to know what the guy is doing so they can either market to market or do proper risk management. And sometimes they have uh, big arguments because the back office say it should, be uh, it should be valued this way for risk management, while the traders say, no, no, it should be higher because of this. So having this knowledge will help them do the job better. Um, so uh, it'll be useful in, in many ways. Uh, in terms of feedback from members, uh, if I, I went to CFA uh, uh, event as well, and Kayak has quite a few events locally. Uh, it's amazing what you see that come to the events. Normally, they are actual uh, hedge fund managers or people uh, not 
uh, in the business or not outside the business. So here they get we get some pretty good feedback on whether it's useful or not, or practical and relevant, uh, and increase marketability for jobs or promotions. Uh, for here, for level one, it's pretty broad based. They focus on four to five different assets. They make some uh, uh, struggle, uh, 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 juggling of the topics, but normally they would have these four or five major ones. So hedge fund is considered one, and then private equity and structured products. Those are considered three distinct. And here recently they included real asset together with commodities. In the previous uh, year or so, they have two separated uh, topics. So commodities is purely trading of commodities or a currency, while real asset would be like real estate, uh, farmland and those. But now they put it into one as one category. Uh, and then we have, this is level one, so professional standards and then risk management and so on. For level one, you'll be asked across a broad base. So you have all the topics, but what they ask are not difficult. It's just a basic introduction and description of what they do. There will be no heavy duty uh, uh, program writing. There will be no uh, 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 looking at how they trade real life because these are just the basics. Uh, for AI, everyone is very specific. So it's hard to say this strategy works this way in a very detailed sense because everyone is doing it differently. Uh, just like for trading, you can say you buy and sell, you do all the graph and technical analysis, but you can have two of the same person sitting in the same room doing the same trade, but even a few minutes difference be of when they buy and sell can be the difference between profits and loss. So it's very hard to do specifics within a program like this. But level one is be like this, a very flat based. Everything is covered in a very normal general sense. For topic two, you get the same topics. But now it will be a lot slightly different. For level one, it will be flat like this, where everything gets covered in a general sense. For level two, you'll be asked for very specific things within each asset class. So this is where all the calculations will be for level two. So for example, for private equity, there'll be lots on the fees and the returns calculations. Because for private equity, in a way, it's like marriage. You sign the paper and you're stuck with the person for quite a while. If you want to leave, even the, law, the lawsuits might take you a few years. So you're committed for a long time, you want more protection. For hedge funds, for example, it's like you live together. You don't like him, you can leave. So if you don't like the hedge fund performance, you can take your money right away within a year or two. So it's a very different risk profile. So for hedge funds perspective, there's not much fees you have to worry about. So private equity mainly on fees and returns calculation. And then commodities really on trading and what strategy is being used, more quant side. For hedge funds, they do convertible bonds. So that is where the major area is for level two. Um, you're actually doing a valuation of convertible, bo convertible bonds plus the hedging of it. So if you find one piece mispriced, you buy the bonds, you want to hatch away all the other risks. So those are the other parts for that part in level two on the hedge funds. The other would be uh, for level two, you have three essay questions. And before they would say, I have one question on sta professional standards and the other two on any other topics. But this is released yesterday and now they specified one question on professional standards the other is on this called a current and integrated topic. And one question or a mixture, the last question will be a mixture of any of these topics. So for this current and integrated topics, this is where it's way ahead of CFA. CFA normally study old stuff, 10 years, five years, three years ago. This current topics, they take the most recent, some are even a year or two or even the same year new research papers and put it in and have you read. So you're really up to date on what's going on. Um, but this is where problems come in. When people do the research, these are done by academics. So when they do the research, they do not have kayak exam in mind. They don't have 
I want to make money as much as possible, as fast as possible in mind. All they want is I want to find if something works. It's pure academic. So going from research to making money or exam, it's one major step. So when you look at a research paper, there's really no, the, the researcher will not put in the research paper. I, I think this will make money. I think uh, uh, there's some opportunities here, or they will not highlight major points for the exam. So for us, if you look through the Swiser notes, we don't have the original text here, but in our notes, uh, in the level two, you have the, I think we have the book here on this current ingredient topic. We actually list out all the major summary of each paper, what was found, how it applies to the curriculum of kayak. So you don't have to sift through the paper, we threw it all and have no clue what it's trying to say, because the conclusion you have in the research paper is purely academic. Uh, so you can look at, take a look at that. They were one of the major benefits of level two. Um, so these are the th several major topics. Um, in case you haven't checked on the website recently, they do updates every two or three years. So they would put in one or two little updates once in a while, but every two or three years they do a major overhaul. So for level two, uh, they do the level one last year. For level two, it's coming due in March. So if you're doing it in, if you're doing level one in March, you see a new one that has been around for at least one test. But if you're doing level two in March, it'll be a complete overhaul. They estimated, normally they change 20, 30% of the content. This one, they, th we haven't got the paper ourselves, but they're indicating about 80% new stuff for level two. A lot of new focus, moving to family office and so on, while the old material, many will be remain, but they are ad adding a lot of new things in. So these are the various new topics. Some were kind of in level one, more detail in level two. So family office is pretty new. It wasn't in the any of the content before. And sovereign wealth funds, they were treated like a regular uh, private equity fund before, but now there's more content on it. Uh, we have more on structured products and infrastructure. Structured products, they didn't have much before. They only have your uh, mortgage and asset-backed securities, but not a lot of other things, but now they add those in. Uh, and uh, other things in private equity and real assets. So if you're doing level one, it should be okay. But level two, if you do level one in March, and then level two in September, we'll have m better knowledge of what it looks like. Okay, but it's hard because for CFA, everyone gets the same paper. For kayak, you, they actually don't know which question you get until you go in, you log in to the exam center, they check your ID, search you, almost, they almost strip search you. So no ID, <laughs> no, no rings, no necklace, no watch, and so on. And then when you log in to do the exam, then they decide the question. So it's purely random. Two person, same time lock in, can have different set of questions. So, but it's all based around that percentage allocation. So, it's hard for us to know what will be more tested when we have a brand new 80% new curriculum. S but by September, we would know more. Okay? Uh, so, that's what uh, the updates are for here. For study time, it really depends. So, it's hard to say how long it will take you. It really depends on your background. If you have done finance before, level one is about 40% quant and basic finance. So if you know all the stats, you know all the calculations, uh, you know your basic cap M and other things, the 40% is pretty good. But if you are not f uh, fluent with those, it'll take a lot longer, okay? So level two will be more in depth on various AI focused topics. And then for level one, you have two sessions of multiple choice questions, 100 questions each. Um, here, sometimes it's hard when you do the exam. For CFA, they do it by topic. So when you sit down, you flip the paper. Oh, this is professional standards. You have 10 questions on it. So your mind is on professional standards for that duration, unless you jump. For kayak, because it's random, sometimes it takes longer to change gear. Because now I'm doing this hedge fund question of this drawdown. Next question is private equity. So you have, you need a few seconds to change gear to a new asset class or new topic. But um, 
the overall it's okay time wise most people come back from the exam level one they finish it just in time so no one seldom have not enough time seldom have a lot of time so they would have finished around just where they should have for level two I found people that finish it quickly either do very well or very poorly <laughs> when they finish very early because for the essay part it's 30 percent so in a way if you know your material if you can write well because normally you need to know something very well to write very clear and short so they finish it quickly because they know the material they type it in and that's all they need uh, the other that finish very short quickly is they were busy at work no time to study but they try anyway so they didn't do well because of that so um, level one normally it's more quantitative because 40 percent it's on quant and for level two there'll be more specific focus on the calculation on those on of those in-depth topics so you might have a lot of quant questions on convertible bonds calculation on the duration on, on the uh, uh, on the uh, 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 on the slope of the uh, uh, option pricing curve, etc. For level two, you have the calculation. Purely, you do it on the computer, so uh, it's not for sure. But generally, since you have to type in your answer, the essay is normally non-calculation, just because how can you write a big formula typing it in? Right, so normally in the essay, it's qualitative, describing, uh, analyzing, checking out strategies or different asset class. For the calculation, it's mainly done in the in the multiple choice. So you might have one question giving all the details, and then several questions related to that. What's what's given to you? Okay. Uh, so level two. You also get questions in level two comparing across different asset class. Right? For level one, it's purely hedge funds, tell me some basics. In level two, since now you know the basics from level one, some questions will go across asset class. So they might ask, what is the risk of certain hedge funds? And then compare it to the other asset class. What's the difference? What are the similarities? So these are the fees. Um, this early bird, we're pretty early for this seminar. So uh, here you still have almost a month to register early for the lower fees. In terms of practice question, so you might want to check some out, right? Um, unfortunately, they don't really give mock exam. So if you sign up and paid and joined and sign up for the exam, you get one free you can buy a second mock exam from kayak but externally uh, if you sign up for the course we have one mock exam we can give you but otherwise there's really not many mock exam available okay so if you want to do practice question you can go through the question bank we have here so we have about 14,000 questions on various topics and you log in you can specify you want the same weighting as they have in the exam so it will randomly draw questions based on those waiting and you try the questions uh, you can try questions you haven't done before or repeat same questions if it didn't do well before right so there's variations on those it helps in that it focuses you on what you're not sure of okay so everyone has their own specialty or better at remember understanding certain topics so it'll help you focus your your time and energy here the pass rate is actually pretty good considering uh, what they're doing they never say how they set the pass rate right for CFA they say they take the highest and seven percent of that this one they seldom they don't actually announce how they calculate but just looking at the overall it's about two-thirds will pass so here you would assume if it's hundred percent as hundred marks as a total most would get probably 80 or so so you would have uh, probably a 60 percent correct number of questions to get this pass rate okay for level two um, normally it's pretty high as well considering you have the essay part for March 06 or uh, 16 it's a blip 
So we're not still sure why it went down like that. Okay, so we're still waiting for them to do more analysis on the margin. So this is for if you have tried before, but the reason uh, is the same for if you have not tried before. It's really the industry is growing. Uh, there's high growth. Um, here it depends on what you want to do, but I found most work challenging. So even if you're not trading or doing hedge fund or private equity, just doing uh, uh, analysis or a support or back office, you learn quite a bit because they try to focus on what's the latest and newest and different ways to look at this, the same thing. So it's very, uh, you learn quite a bit from doing those. Uh, so here um, you have the concepts ready if you have done it before, so it'll take a lot less time. Here for us, um, the content is pretty big. If you look at the original text, it's about that big. And then level one, you have that, that book. Level two, you have that book, which are the core topics, and the other, the, the other topics that are the new research papers. When you look at our book, it's about the same size. <laughs> so you thought, how come I pay you money to give me this book that's the same size? Why don't I just read the original myself? Here, we focus on different things. The original book was actually compiled from different texts. When I did my kayak, I have to buy 12 different books, which is very expensive, and I read two chapters out from each book. The others I kept, but I only use two chapters, because one book is on a private equity J-curve, and I do two chapters, and not on a hedge fund. Here, now they put all the chapters into one book, so you don't have to buy 12 different books. On the other hand, when you read the original text, because they don't actually adjust or change the content, you have conflicts. So some of the chapters you would read and there's a misconnect because the chapter is based on a whole book with something in, the in, a, in front and something in the end, but then you just take two chapters out of it. So it's distinct and sometimes they don't connect very well. For our tags, we make the connection better. So we relates to how it relates to the uh, 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 topic being tested. And we focus more, we write more on the part you are tested. Original book, sometimes they do very quick calculations. They don't explain very well because they assume you know the material and you're just reading it for, for reference. Here we do more in-depth calculations. So in the exam, you need those uh, in case you're not very sure. Um, so here, this is a little bit of what they do in the calculations. For qualitative, um, let me do level one and two separately. For level one, they have qualitative and quantitative. So level one will be qualitative, meaning just writing or uh, a discussion, or quant, the calculation part. For level one, there's lots of quants, but are the basic ones. So you have your ratios, you have your stats and things. So for the quant calculation level one, it's just straightforward, just count. Uh, if you have run through the material, um, you should do okay. For the qualitative, it's pretty straightforward as well. It's purely b based on the original text. For level two, this is where this applies. For the qualitative, it starts to ask across different asset class. So they'll have you compare between um, different assets or they compare the risk of different asset class if you are the investor or the manager. Right? So more, more perspective. For the calculation, this is where this apply for level two. You would have two types. One is more difficult but mechanical. So this is the tedious calculation like private equity fees, where you go through many different steps to find the right number of fees they're charging or the overall net fee they're charging after several years of operation. Uh, here it's not difficult, or it's difficult, but it's mechanical. So just going through the steps, if you miss the step, then you get it wrong. The other is uh, easy but theoretical question. So it's only one line but it tests if you know the concept or not. So for example, binomial tree is one. 
where they can ask a very simple question on the formula and see if you know which parts does what or the why do I need to have this calculation in this formula what does it do right so if you understand the formula it's a slum dunk if you don't know the formula this or if you don't understand it you uh, have to figure out what it's trying to do so you see these two here in level two um, so this is example of if I have a difficult tedious but just mechanical calculation so these are examples of fees for private equity I mentioned just now uh, private equity is a long commitment seven or at least five to twelve years so as an investor you want to protect your money because you, you you don't know what will happen within the seven years when it's running so you have many fees you have committed on management fee and then these are all the other fees that you might have to pay either directly or indirectly through the invested companies so you have transaction fees and monitoring fees and those are on the investment total size so if I put in two million into a private equity committed he took one million and do a ten times leverage and spend ten million to buy an investment uh, investment this is on the total investment size not my share of one million of my money right so it's different base you calculate this on and this offsets as well so some of these fees offset against each other so uh, when you add them together it can be pretty messy luckily they do it in two separate bulk I hear um, anyone here work for a family office we have several students from previous times where they work for a family office so a rich guy that either set of a trust or a family office and they invest in private equity or other funds and they can never figure out how they calculate the fees just because it's so complex right even they get the full statement they can't figure out why you're charging me this why am I paying for this so here it's one big piece of fees calculation this will in in by default will also in, involve your returns calculation as well right the other piece here which are separated always is your hurdle rate which is a messy messy stuff right so we'll look you look at it in level two but it's a hurdle rate where the manager promised the investor a minimum return before they get their performance fee and then once it passed you can have a catch-up where you pay the manager more a higher level first before you're back to the normal level and then it's the same level going up right so it's a messy thing to do they always separate the two so um, you do one on the fees or the hurdle rate of how to split the money so this is the tedious version for the simple but theoretical calculation questions you would have like option valuation in convertible bonds so you know in binomial tree you might have to calculate the delta or gamma of a simple uh, uh, convertible or the option for a lot of these if you know the option calculation you can guess the answer but if you're not sure then it's really clueless so this is understanding is more important this binomial tree is being used in several different places so in convertible bonds it's used in great depth we it's also used when you try to figure out the chance of default when you price your CDS so it's also in more detail in that model but it's also used for real asset so uh, it's being used to value land in the real asset section so it's being used in different places but in different depth different difficulty but convertible bonds will be the place where it's uh, calculating great depth so this is pretty much overall what they do um, here another thing other than the random question choice when you log in is they love multi-part questions so when you check oh a hundred questions I have let's say level one I have morning session a afternoon session B 100 multiple choice question for each so I would calculate how many questions do I have so if I look back at my waiting let's say oh I really don't like private equity so level one private equity 
five to ten percent. So worst case, ten percent on each. I'll get ten questions each. Right? I have a hundred questions. Ten percent maximum will be ten questions each on private equity. And you thought, oh, next thing I do, I flip through the book. I look at 10 of the highest chance being asked places, and I study those. I'll pass. Unfortunately, they do multi-topic uh, questions or compound questions. They would have two multiple choice questions put in one question. So you have to answer both questions correctly before you get that one multiple choice question mark. We're OK? So it's not easy because even though the weight is not a lot, 10 questions, but within this 10, it can have 15, 20 different sub-questions within that, right, if you have two parts to one question. So this is overall. Any questions for this part? Yep. Mm -hmm. Yes. Um, when you sign up and pay, they will send you a link and to this Pearson View. Uh, this is the place where you took the exam. Uh, so you would go to the Pearson View website, log in, put in your own password you set before, and they would know you're doing you know, level one. Within the range of dates, you will see what time are available. But they hide all the times. They hide some of the time. So when you check, oh, this is the two weeks you can take the exam. These are the times available. If you go back in maybe you know an hour later, you see different times. So they don't show you the full, th they don't want you to have too many choices. Right? So you would see the time there. You can change it any time. Most students will book the first few days, and then they will change the later day because they want more time to study. But you can go back and lock in and change any time. Um, sometimes they, have, they don't show all the openings. So if you go back a little bit later, you will find new slots open. Because it's hard to imagine people changing that many times within that one hour period. Right? So I suspect they're holding back some slots and give it to you as they see fit. Um, and then when you get to Pearson View, I think they only do it in Shenhua. There are many of this, because many exam use their service. So we do ours in the Shenhua, this new century building or something. It's right by the MTR. But you need to go early, because uh, they actually go through pretty strict search. They would have no watch, everything put in a locker, and very strict on the ID. And then you sign, I think you put in your thumb, take picture, and then th you walk in and do the exam. When I was doing it there, I remember a kid cried because uh, th they do other exams as well. So they do like GMAT or other things on there. And this high school kid maybe want to go to the US for school, went in for the exam. Two IDs, pictures, signature, one didn't fit. And he was crying, calling his mom. They don't let me in because I have no ID. So they're very strict. Make sure you bring everything you need. Uh, for kayak, you will go in pretty much only your clothes <laughs> and nothing, not much else. They give you a, a small piece of uh, oil board. So you can do your calculations on there, but no paper, only calculator. Yeah. Any other questions on the logistics? depends on your goal of reading it, <laughs> right? If, let's say when I do it, I'll be honest. My goal is I want to pass the exam. That's my goal when I was reading the, 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 the books for the, for the questions. Um, so probably depends on, um, it's not I'm selling our service here, but if you go back and read, this is what I found. 
the formulas are actually not hard. You don't have to reinvent the, the formula or the wheel. So understanding and how to use it can be a very simple five minute explanation once you see the number click. For me, a lot of calculation and quants, I don't get it the first time, but I think about it and then sometimes it clicks. Like once you see how it works, then it's become very transparent. Before that, it's completely un un cannot understand. So coming to class will speed you up in that process. But sometimes you can do many questions. You can read it five times over two months before it clicks. Because right? you have to do many questions before you know why it's doing that way. Coming to class, one practice question, you're done with understanding this formula. So here, if you read on your own, it will take a lot more time. Because reading it doesn't help you understand how it works. It just shows the results. Um, so it will probably be a, a little bit more than what they recommend. But coming to class will cut down on the time because we focus on what tr which part are, are difficult and takes time to study. So it will help you click a lot faster. No. We we'll focus only on the major calculation parts, the hard to understand parts, and the more likely tested parts. Many of the things like reading we won't go through because there's no point of me reading it back to you what it's written uh, that can be easily understood just for reading on your own. Right. Other questions? Yes. Uh, we should. In a way, it's hard to say because I can drive a car, but I can't make a car <laughs> out of bare metal, right? So it's in class, we'll teach how to drive, but in in we're not reconstructing the formula, right? So I'll, I'll tell you which, each fo which each symbol means, uh, why it's in there, and how it's being done in a formula that certain way. But for the exam, a lot of the input is given to you. Right? So it, they're not testing you to calculate you know, a 10-step a, a, a pro uh, process. They're checking, if I tell you the numbers, do you know what it means? Right? So we'll go through the, the symbols, what they do, and what they mean, more of calculating it. Because in the exam, you can't go through a lot of calculations anyway. Right. If you do not come to this class, a lot. <laughs> if you come to this class, probably not more than 10. A lot of the formulas, you can actually estimate. You have four choices. Many formulas, uh, after you calculate, two of the answers you know will not be correct. Because normally they would have a range. If you, let's say um, option value or option uh, delta, it's they give you two negative answer, two positive numbers. So you know if it's a call option, then the two negative cannot be correct, right? So by screening, if you understand the formula or what it's trying to do, you can cancel a lot of the non-logical answers. So even if you don't remember the formula you can still figure out which one is the right answer. <laughs> what is the, that is the fun part of doing this. Or the useful part for you is you don't have to spend years doing it to figure out what it's trying to do. So if you think of the pass rate is about 65, right, level one, so you have four, qu four, four, four multiple choice, randomly you get 25%, right? So here, if you have 65% out of maybe 80%, so 
So that is about 60, 50, 60 percent correct. So four, four choices in a multiple choice question, randomly select, you get 25, one out of four. Here you only s need to, to be correct or you select uh, half of the correct, you should be able to pass, barely at that level, right? So if you can detect one, one uh, choice as being incorrect, then it increases your chance of passing by a, pr a pretty big amount. If uh, I'm assuming 60%, 68, 60, 65 pass rate, but it's not based on 100% correct, right? So if I'm assuming 80% of the people pass, and they pass by 60%, so it is about 60-ish, 50-ish they get right. Correct? Huh? I, they never say. But I would assume they cannot, 60% of the people pass and get 100% mark. Right, because no one will get 100% correct. Well, I think someone might, I'm not sure. You say how many change? Oh no, no, uh, much bigger. I, I let me repeat. They do a um, update every three to four years. Level one had just done was being updated recently. About thirty percent changed. Okay, so and the level two was due for update this year, uh, September, but. They didn't do any updates. And then they tell us, oh, next March, level two updates, but a gigantic update. So the 70, 80%. Yeah. So here it doesn't affect you if you're doing level one, right? Because if you do level one in March, the level two is updated. So it's only the one that did it before level one, now they're faced with pr brand new material. No. You mean in September of 1-7 to level two. It's not more difficult, but just a lot more new stuff. Uh, probably, have you studied? You've passed level one, and now you you just passed September. Okay, have you studied for level two? Okay, um, I don't think it make any difference. Because the new stuff is put in, which is not in level one anyway, right? So um, it would take two years for them to put some level two stuff, which are new into level one. So if you're taking it now and you haven't started any studying for level two, you're faced with the new stuff anyway. So it doesn't matter how much they change, it's still still new stuff to you, right? Unless you study already for the old stuff, and now you realize, oh, so much change, then it'll, it'll be different. But if you haven't started, there'll be no difference. Um, the level one hasn't changed much. We'll have the material early November. For the uh, level two, we don't get the material physically from kayak until I think December. Yeah, because we actually read all the material and rewrite it. Yeah. Yeah. 
Well, it, that's a wiser note of availability. So it might be earlier if you buy the actual book, but uh, you don't really need to with the wiser notes. But if you want to buy the book, you can. It's a good book to have anyway. Other questions? Okay, so let me go through a few demo questions. Here, because we're not actually doing a class, so here I'm trying to put in some questions which even without any studying, without doing looking at a level one book, we can go through a simple uh, logical process and back out the answer correctly. Okay, so here, first, I need to do a little bit of uh, qualitative, so you see how they break down the material. So, this is one of the topic seven in level one. It's on credit risk. So, this is the risk of someone not paying you back your loan, or if you want to buy insurance. Let's say I'm a bond bond fund manager. I own twenty different bonds, and two bonds from Ford Motors might be defaulting. And I'm afraid if they default, I lose my money. So I go to an iBank, I buy a CDS. So if those two bonds defaulted, they pay me back some or the interest or the principal. Right? So in this case, I either have to evaluate the credit risk or when I buy the CDS, the seller of the CDS has to evaluate the chance of default so he can price it correctly for me. Right, it's just like I'm afraid I might have a serious illness and I want to buy insurance. So when I buy my when I apply, he asks many questions. Do you smoke? Uh, family history of serious illness, all those evaluate the chance of me claiming him. That is what this is doing. Right, evaluating the chance of default based on the market price. So here, because I'm selling insurance, so I need to specify when will you claim, <laughs> right? I cannot just a blanket health insurance to you. So this is more of when you can claim. So there's three levels of default uh, 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 risk. So one would be, the bottom one would be just a regular credit spread risk. This is just the market movements or uh, unknown, not very important factors. So the market price move all the time anyway. Right, so some will buy uh, a risk for downgrade. As if you get a downgraded risk of downgrade, uh, the price might change by quite a bit. Or you can buy the the risk on default. So in this case, you get payback um, either princ principal interest if the bond actually defaulted. So you don't get payback when it's downgraded. You can choose which level of protection you buy. Right, so based on what you ask, the seller of the CDS will tell you how much it costs to buy the insurance. So this is the models they use. So f this is for figuring out the chance of default for a CDS or any asset structure. So here we have the structural model. This one used pure cash flow. So you'd like doing your asset, your, your um, equity analyst, you do all the cash flow and figure out the chance of default based on that cash flow structure. Here we don't cover it this way here, just because it's too much work to do, and it's just your an equity analysis. But uh, fun thing is when I do my CFA, or I guess FRM, I study many things inside the curriculum. I seldom see people use it. <laughs> so what you study is not the same as what they do real life, but for Kayak, um, there is a, a for there's a place called GARP. It is the organization for FRM. So they have many free web-based video. And so one of them invited a guy to come in and say, oh, you're the risk manager of this big investment bank. Tell me how you do your risk pricing at the end of the day. And he's doing the structural model for the one hour. So he goes through all the model things. So he was doing things that actually do real life. Uh, in at work. So this one is structural model. Reduced form is like when you price your option, right? When I when I'm an equity analyst, I assume market price not correct. I do my own analysis. That my target price is twenty dollars higher, right? This is like your option pricing, where I assume market price is correct, and I back out the chance or volatility from that, right? So reduced form would do here, but 
we don't look at the formula here, but these are the things they do in terms of different models they use and how it's being used and what are the inputs. We're doing three questions. This is one which here it's under the real asset uh, uh, topic in level one. So here's just checking without going through the, the material, you can, for these three questions, pretty much figure out the answer. Right? So this is which type of real, as real estate investment most likely benefit. So you want whatever scenario that benefits from inflation. Here's assuming it's high inflation. Right, so who benefits from high inflation in these three cases? So these are assuming these are real estate uh, for commercial, either shopping mall or commercial buildings. We assign a very long lease. So if I have a long lease property, I sign for 10 years, and you have adjustments for CPI or other things, but it's based on normal inflation, right? So if I have a probably the long lease and suddenly inflation go up to 30% in year three after I sign, then is it good or bad for me as a property owner? Do I benefit or do I lose? I'll probably lose, right? Because I signed the agreement for the rental contract for 10 years, 5% CPI adjustment, maximum 5% increase in rent. Suddenly, year three, thirty percent up, my income cannot catch up. So it cannot be it be beneficial to me as an owner of a, a probably long term lease. How about for the adjustable rate mortgage? So this is on the revenue side, right? Revenue don't go up with the inflation. Uh, how about this is the cost side, the expense, right? So adjust adjustable rate mortgage. The rates go up and down with the market rate. So here, since it adjusts, inflation goes up. If I combine A and B, I'll get killed. Revenue don't go up as much, but my rate go up for my cost expense side. So this by itself uh, probably will might hurt me as well, right? So no benefits. Here, if I have a fixed rate loan, then it benefits me, right? Because if I lock in the rate, market rate is higher, it benefits me uh, for having a fixed rate loan. Right? So this one is pretty self-explanatory. Um, so this was not too bad. This is one of the formulas for smoothing. So in two of the topics, you have this effect. In your private equity and your real estate, you have this effect because you don't get a good market price for it. If you're doing hedge fund commodity trading, you get a market price all the time, which is market and fair. For private equity, seven years uh, contract you sign. In year three, I need a, a mark to market. What do they give you? Oh, uh, NAV or estimated. It's not a market price. Real estate also. You get an appraisal from a real estate agent. You don't actually know what the actual market price is until you sell. So under these two topics as a class, the price you get quoted are non-market price. So in a way, because of this, you get a smoothing effect, meaning if the price are like this, actual price, if you only get an appraised price, the price gets moved. It doesn't move as much as the actual price because human do appraisal, I look at last last year's, last month, and it's moved the price from market. So you got this effect, and this is used to unsmooth the price. So now I tell you, the price you were quoted is smoothed, and this factor is a smoothing factor, meaning how much of the old price get carried out in the price you have in the price you're quoted. So here, this is one where, let me put it this way. So it's the 0.6, it's like a leftover pizza. So every day I order one pizza, I love pizza. So let's say I have 10 slices of pizza. And 0.6 is like I ate four, and six slices are left over, right? So when I when I buy another pizza tomorrow, 
I would have one pizza plus six lights left from the other day. So you have to back out and ask, well, how much was left over yesterday or how much is new today? So when you look at this, it would be the price I get quoted. These are smoothed price, not market. It's 20 and it increased to 30. So a $12 increase for the period based on the smoothed price. So now let's check what is the actual price change. Okay, and point six is the is the amount that is new in this case. Here it's not clear. We have several formulas using this. So without calculation, when you look at A, B, C, D, you can guess the answer because here. 0.6 is the leftover amount. So if I say I have six slides of pizza left over, how much was the original pizza? How many slides originally before you ate the four? Right? So here, the increase is $12. So t s just like my six piece of pizza left over, how much was the actual pizza before? It has to be bigger than that, right? Because leftover is six pieces so if the increase is 12 shown here and 0 0.6 is, a, is the leftover factor original must be higher than 12. So when you look through the answer A, B and D cannot be correct right if the actual price change is this much how can I get a $12 increase in my quote it's impossible right this is a leverage return which is not for this case so 20 would only possible answer in this case, this, this, uh, this symbol for the formula can mean either the leftover or the one they had carried over. So here, if you're not sure which one, look at the answer. Three of them cannot be correct, so only one is possible based on the size of the number, even without the formula. Okay. The last one, this one we'll do here, is a little bit on the market structure. So if you know how the market works on these, then this one it will be pretty straightforward. Um, but this is the benefits of coming to class here. We go through these and give you a logical framework to go through these logically. You don't have to memorize all the formulas. So here, which one of the following strategy is the best way to hedge the risk? So it's, it's hedging. I'm not speculating, right? Because here we are the speculator. Here I'm trying to hatch. So I'm trying to hatch the risk of a commodity producer. All of these is a trigger. So hatch or speculation, they do exactly opposite things. Producer and user are different parties. They do different things as well, opposite. And that is another thing. So here, before I do any analysis, if I want to hatch, when I look down here, it's A, B, C, D. Three are based on options. One is on futures. I need to hatch away some risk. For options, you can never hatch with options if you short them. right? You can only hatch if you buy the option. The option gives you a right to, to do something. Right, so if I short the option, I have no right. I lose my right to do something. So it cannot be a hatch, right? I'd except in one certain condition. But in this case, when I look through the list, in A, I'm selling an option. So this one cannot be a hatch by default. So this one is out. I have three left. So I need to figure out which one is correct, right? So here, I start to sift through what they have here. So producer. This is the farmer. So mm, this is not a Halloween figure. It's a farmer. It's a straw hat. So he produces wheat. Wheat. And this is the producer. So this can be a producer of wheat, of oil, natural gas. And we have Kellogg here. So this is the Kellogg box. This is the, this is the factory. They make cereal. They're the user of wheat, right? So farmer produce, 
Kellogg buys it, make into cereal and sell to us. Here, the wheat goes over, and for the farmer, the wheat market price is his revenue, right? Because he sells the wheat and he receives the money. The wheat market price is his revenue, so the risk for the farmer is the market price go down. For the user, when he buys the wheat, the wheat is his cost. So for the Kellogg of the world or the user of the world, the, pr the risk is the market price go up. The cost will go up, no profit, right? So here, if you look at the question, this is a producer. So I'm the farmer. So the farmer have shareholders under equity and he borrow money as debt and you bought his debt. So you're afraid, how can I hatch his default risk? So you check. For the farmer, I'm looking at that guy now, his risk would be the market price of wheat go down, his revenue go down, cost stays the same, profit goes down, no cash to pay me. So for him, that is his risk, wheat price go down. For me, if I want to hatch it, then for my hatch position, I must make a profit when the wheat price go down. Right? So if the wheat price go down, the farmer is in hot water, he's losing money, he might default, but my hatch makes money for me. Right? So when I look through the list, I need to make money when the wheat price go down. When I buy a call, I make money when the price go up. So if you asked how can I hatch a commodity user's risk, then you buy a call option. But here I'm doing the producer, so I want a put option that gives me profit when the price of the wheat go down. So put will be one potential. You short futures also possible, right? Because when you short futures, your profit looks like this. Wheat price go up, wheat price go up, you lose money, but wheat price go down, you make money when you short a futures, right? So in principle, C and D can both work, but we have, we need to choose one. So when you look at that, this is the one that makes a difference, right? So the producer will say it's so first, A is out for sure. Producer means not B. And then the debt will tell me whether it's C or D. Okay. For the debt, if you do some option structure, that looks like this. This is a debt. So a debt looks like this for the payoff profile. If the company does well, wheat price go up, revenue go up, the farmer is doing very well, very rich. If you own the debt, you get paid back the same interest rate. No upside benefit for that, right? If the, mar if the wheat price go down um, and the farmer has no revenue, profit warning, um, now you're in trouble. So when the farmer is in trouble, then your bond price go down this way. So for your payoff profile of debt, it's like this. If I buy a put, then it'll be like this. It'll be like this. So my put and my debt cover exactly perfect, right? So if the wheat price go down, the debt will be in trouble. My, my put option will make money. So I get a hedge position like this, flat. If I have my if I have my debt like this, if I put a sell uh, if I sh if I choose D, if I short the futures, short futures like this, right? So short futures like this. So if the wheat price go down, I have a perfect hatch because now they offset each other. But if the wheat price go up, then my hedge position has a loss. So in a way, this cannot, the futures position 
can only hatch the downside. But if I'm doing well, farmer doing well, it doesn't give me a loss because futures are non uh, is symmetric, while option is asymmetric, right? So because it's dead, then I have to use put options and not futures because it's dead. Okay, so here we can sift through. This is doing the whole picture. In the exam, you can just go through one by one and figure out which one it is directly. Okay, so this is the three questions we'll do. For the last two, I put it in to show how they ask quantitative questions in a qualitative ways. <laughs> so in the in the curriculum, you have the formula to calculate this. This is using two models. This is a Black Scholes options. Uh, they also have a Merton's model. It's just two two ways to structure the same Lego block. But this is looking at how the the thing is structured to do a evaluation for a convertible. So this is not a calculation, but you must know the model and what is being put as a strike price in theory for evaluation. Right? So it's a quant theory, but qualitatively asked. Same with this one. This is in level one. This is on allocation, strangely. So here, the story is, I have a million dollars to invest. And I'm allocating. So what am I buying with this one million dollar? So here, you can in allocate by return to risk, which is what most people do. In this particular topic, it's allocating by risk. So you allocate, decide how much to buy of what, based on the risk allocation. So this is how to calculate the risk level to decide how many of each asset to buy. So here you have this component, marginal, and total vow. Again, in the, in the curriculum, you have to calculate and figure out your weighting. He just asks which one relates to what. Right? This one we won't do because we need, the, we need the notes to do it. But these are the things you'll be asked. So even though quant formula not too many, but these are asking for your understanding of how it works, but not a calculation. Right, so these are semi-quant qualitatively. A guy dressed, a guy dressed, uh, wearing a dress, or a female wearing a suit. <laughs> okay. So here you can check uh, the answer with Mavis later on, but we won't go through this here. So here I need to give it to her. So for the fun part of this.